<clears throat> what we're going to uh, go over today uh, has to do with uh, uh, an idea uh, that I've had for a long time, having taken a lot of classes uh, and uh, been in the educational uh, system through high school, college, medical school, uh, even when I uh, ran the Green Beret Medic Training Program uh, during Vietnam, which was basically uh, uh, very educational in terms of they were going to be completely by themselves. And they, as opposed to a regular uh, medic, they really had to be educated so they could deal with uh, circumstances and situations. Uh, as opposed to regular medics who dealt with predictable situations, they would encounter different situations. So they couldn't do it by the numbers, they actually had to kind of have more of an understanding and in my mind be more educated uh, in, in the pure sense of education. And what that kind of led me to was uh, to realize that um, one of the differences between vocational education or training uh, and what I think is probably a, a more efficient way uh, to educate people is to approach what you're trying to teach uh, through understanding. Now, it, in the simplest terms to me, what you can kind of do is you can sort of look at this as um, there's understanding, which I'm going to try to uh, give a very uh, uh, specific definition to, and then there are operations uh, and applications which produce results and if you get the uh, desired results you end up with something that I think can be well described as performance which is attaining results now if you start with operations and applications and results you can basically train somebody uh, to produce a specific result it would be similar uh, when I was young, it's kind of what helped me decide I wanted to get more education. It's almost like working in a factory, is that you learn to operate these things and you get results. But my basic premise is that if things are presented initially where you introduce understanding early on, then it is easier and more efficient for people to get up to this part with operations, applications, and results, and overall the performance will be better. But then that raises the question, you know, what is understanding? And I think to uh, have an understanding of understanding, so to speak, you have to kind of go back and ask yourself, uh, look at the forest instead of the trees, and instead of just memorizing equations and so forth, you need to look at what those equations actually represent in terms of a human being interacting with the physical world and making changes that allow one to uh, uh, get a result and and, and function. Um, and if you talk about, let's say, uh, reality, and then you talk about existence, there's a kind of a, what I think is a simple way to look at this, where there are basically only three types of existence, one of which I'm not going to address because the thing that we've chosen to go over today to try to make this point is mathematics. So I'm going to try to, in the context of uh, existence and reality and how it all works, uh, give a 
more precise definition of what mathematics is, uh, and also uh, with that understanding of what mathematics is, go on to uh, give a, def a, a clear definition and one that provides more understanding of what mathematics is rather than, let's say, more conventionally, uh, it might be taught where what you do is you start out with equations and so forth and you just kind of learn how they work and then hopefully go off, go into something else that not only enables you to pass mathematical tests but to actually uh, go out and use these equations to do things. So the idea would be to kind of front end some understanding uh, at a certain point it, that would enable you not only to operate uh, mathematics, but actually apply it uh, for, for, for the good of uh, accomplishing things in other fields like engineering, medicine, uh, and so forth. If we, if we look at what, exi what existence is, I'm going to just say that there are two types of, three types of existence, one of which uh, we're probably not going to deal with because our goal here is to move into mathematics. The first existence <clears throat> is physical existence. And for the most part, uh, physical existence operates mechanically. So it could be looked at as, as physical existence or physical mechanical resistance, uh, existence. Now, the second type of existence is neurological. And what that is, is that is the way, since we're talking about education and we're talking about uh, human beings, the way that a human being, so it's neurological human, and let's just move to the highest level known in the universe in terms of uh, uh, neurological processing. Uh, the human brain. So what happens is you have an interaction between the physical mechanical existence and its reality and the neurological and we could call this biological or phys uh, physiological uh, entity uh, and we're going to use the human brain as the example here. And that creates a certain reality. And the more equal these are, then the more you're dealing with reality and the more you're connected to the real physical world or environment that that you're trying that you're trying to deal with. Now, um, this and, and let me just briefly name the third thing, which I, I'm not being dismissive of it, but uh, it, it it's it, it's not directly involved in mathematics, and that is I'm going to talk about spiritual. Okay. And what the spiritual is, is this, that part that exists and it's faith, uh, it's a belief in things that don't necessarily have to be verified or directly connected to uh, uh, phys physical existence. And for the most part, okay, if we deal with uh, the term that most people uh, uh, would be familiar with, if we, for example, deal with physics, when you 
try to put, when you put all of this together, it's kind of called metaphysical. I don't know of a term called metamathematical, but what I, what I want to try to do here is s stick to the, the physical, uh, uh, mechanical reality existence and its processing by the neurological entity, the human brain, and create a thing called reality, which is basically the correlation between these two. And then the, the, less, that, the less they correlate, we could call that a reality gap. So what happens is, is that this neurological entity has perception or perceives and then it processes what it perceives and it comes up with a reality that is neurological. Then this reality and this uh, uh, frame of reference can then be applied back into in this instance, the, the physical world, so that things can be operated, and then when you learn how to operate them, you can apply them, and then when you're operating on the physical world and you have an application in mind, you get a result, and it enables you to perform. Now, what is it that enables this interaction that defines rea the reality? And again, what I'm going to suggest is there are only three ways that, the, that this is interpreted by or understood. I guess I just call it under understanding is developed. On the neurological side, because of the way it's perceived and represented. And the first is, and it's most common in day to day, so I'm going to list it first, is words. And what we do is, we use words and what we call that when we use words is language. The second way that the connection is made here is with numbers or symbols. And what I'm going to suggest is that that is what mathematics really is. So if you want a definition of mathematics, which is what we're going to focus on in this presentation. What mathematics is, is a way that the neurological system, and we're kind of focusing here on the human brain, connects to the physical, mechanical uh, uh, reality of its external environment, and then perceives it and processes it. And the last way, and again, I'm only listing three here, is through images. And basically, if you look at, if you look at each of these, they actually describe what all of these are composed of. And I'm going to call this stuff. This is one of Albert Einstein's favorite words. And since we're doing mathematics, I'm going to leap, I'm going to move a little bit towards science here. And what stuff is, is energy. And again, without getting into too much 
That's why, you know, this equation that you've all heard, and it's like the world's most famous equation, is E equals MC squared. And although it's got symbols in it, which we'll understand a little better, hopefully, as we go through here, uh, it, it's really, you know, a mathematical relationship. So, then it, we can take each of these, and we can look at what, and I'm just going to do this generally, how each of these is kind of expressed. And again, what we're going to eventually focus on completely, hopefully uh, what I'm laying here, laying here is groundwork in a context where we can look at the different forms of mathematics. I'm going to talk about things that are static and things that are dynamic. And what that really talks about is whether or not they're changing. And the best definition of energy is that stuff, and all stuff is energy that can, uh, we can use the word produce or create, change. And if, okay, it creates change, we call it dynamic, and if it doesn't create change, we call it static. Now, I'm going to introduce one other thing here that's very important in terms of energy, when you look at things in terms of energy. It, it has to do with a boundary. And I'll come back to this in the context of uh, mathematics, but what happens is, is that in order to deal with something like energy or stuff, okay, it's very useful to, to have uh, a boundary which then creates something that we could call an entity. And then once you've established an entity, it can have a quantity, it can have a size, it can have a position, etc. But you really need to have an idea that all energy has a boundary, which then and it create, it allows it to be considered as an entity or processed as an ent entity neurologically by the human brain. So now what we've got is, we've got uh, whether or not it's changed, we've got an entity that's changing or not. So let's just briefly, and this will be a simplification, talk about words, okay? The category that we have here for words that are static is, and, and have a defined boundary, is a noun. The category, we we have for a word that describes something that's moving or changes is a verb. And then we have qualifiers that we put in there. Qualifiers uh, for nouns are called adjectives. Qualifiers for verbs are, it's almost mathematical, they're called adverbs because they add to our understanding of verbs. Let's talk about images. Static images are pictures. Dynamic images are, I guess in today's parlance, we won't call them movies anymore, we'll call them videos, okay? So then, now what I want to do is I want to take this, what this is kind of a framework and a background, and I want to address what this is kind of the context of the way it all works, a definition of mathematics and look into how it fits into understanding and operations. So, what mathematics is in the broadest sense is, okay, a way that we can represent 
and process those perceptions that we have of our external environment through our senses, which then enables us to understand and then operate, apply, and change our external and even our internal environment if, you, if you're a doctor or something like that, uh, to get results that we would like to be able uh, to obtain and actually be able to predict whether or not they're going to happen and so forth, which is basically uh, when, when you move into science which I'm not going to discuss what science really is, uh, but I think it would be fair to say that a definition of mathematics would in some part or some place, maybe right at the beginning, say mathematics is a science. And this kind of gives us an overview of what uh, verbiage or words are, what images are, and what mathematics is. And now I want to focus specifically with that in mind on the different types of mathematics and how they might be presented uh, in aggregate as mathematics. And in terms of looking at each one, when you go to teach it, how you might put it in a perspective with an understanding of how it fits into what we've presented here. So now, as we, as we move into mathematics, uh, for the sake of uh, having a little more space on the board and stuff, I'm going to take this part, which is more general and relates it to science and energy, uh, boundaries and entities, and just kind of assume that we got that part, this part. And I'm going to make a list. And all of this will be in, 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 this, in this context with the idea that we're here and we can work it up through here. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to switch to... Oh, I don't see it here. Okay, I guess I'll, I thought I had that black one here. Better cut it off. Oh, I'm going to, I didn't leave it in. <laughs> we get typical ADD absent-minded professor. Couldn't find my marker because I put it in my pocket, the last place I would look. Uh, bad for lectures, bad for life. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to sort of put this in sequ sequentially with the idea that we now have a definition of mathematics and I'm going to try to kind of th this will sort of be uh, in, in in a time frame and the complexity and sort of how it perhaps evolved, although it won't be exact. It does correlate a bit, I think, to the way it's taught in school, because you all know that you have to take certain types of mathematics before you can move on to, to the next type. And hopefully this will show this a little better. So what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say that the, origina the origination of mathematics and the simplest form of mathematics is called arithmetic. And what arithmetic really does is it, for the most part, deals with the entities. And it kind of, kind of came about because here, you know, two guys are sitting here and there's either one there, there's two there, or whatever. So what it does basically is it uh, tells how many, in words it would be how many, and every mathematical thing can be expressed in words and demonstrated in pictures, if we go back to this. So it, it, it tells how, ma how, ma how many 
okay, which is a number, and how much. Which would, let's say this would be the size and this would be the, the, the number or units of entity. And it's, it's pretty simple, okay? Uh, we call numbers that represent that real numbers. Uh, decimals and so forth, although they're not whole numbers, actually are, are quant quantitating things, okay? Not so much in terms of how many are there, but perhaps in terms of their size. And the thing that you kind of want to realize is, is that we need an expression for this. And again, I, I, I'm not really sure this is taught, but I'm going to give a very simple example. So now let's say I have one. And over here, I have two. Now, I'm going to put an equal sign here. Now, now, this is something that I think you're expected to kind of learn, but an equal sign is a boundary. It's, it's a boundary, okay? So what I say is if I got one on this side and I got two on this side, okay, those aren't equal. Okay, but if I want to use an equal sign here on each side of this boundary, okay, I got to put another one here to make both sides equal. And, you know, I don't know, but to me, I didn't used to think very much that an equal sign was a boundary. I just kind of thought, well, there's an equal sign, and if I put one on this side, I can't put two on the other side unless I put another one on this side. So this is basically a representation of the physical, the, the, the physical reality. But then, and, and so what you come up with then, is you come up with addition and subtraction. And that's kind of taught as the simplest form of mathematics. But then people kind of figured out that it took a long time if you had 10 of something, let's say, we use units of 10, and then you had 10 more units of 10 to count to 100. So what they kind of came up with was a shortcut to do that, which is called multiplication and division, and these are basically other operations where these addition and subtraction are operations and multiplication and division are operations, but they're basically arithmetic in terms of they're telling you how many and how much. So now we've got a way to get a, get, get a handle on uh, what's going on there. Well, you know, that's good, but in terms of what this physical existence is and everything, and actually being able to process it with our brains, it would be good not to just know what's there in terms of how many and its size, but to have a, have a better understanding of what we're dealing with. So now, what we do is, we go into something called geometry. And again, without going into a lot of detail, which would be, let's say, a more advanced presentation, what I'm going to suggest is that geometry involves, for the most part, space and shape. Now, if you take this a little further, what you really get into is you get into things have dimensions, which I don't want to go into detail, because I just want to kind of get a basic understanding of what geometry is, which is a way to describe space and shape, okay, which provides a handle on structure 
statically and maybe also with an understanding of what it is an increased ability to deal with function. So we have geometry now which is space and shape and I'm going to introduce uh, something else here. I'm going to say that for the most part there are two types of geometry. And again, these are simplifications. Okay, they're lines. And if you, if you look up a definition, you'll see points. And this is a little bit dimensional. They're points, they're lines, and they're curves. And then if you combine arithmetic and geometry physically, you now have something that enables you to measure things. And now when you start to measure things, you're back to arithmetic in terms of you got one, two, or three, but if we're dealing with the real physical world here, when you start measuring things, you also then have to have an understanding of the units you're using to measure things with. And again, as I think back on my education and so forth, one of the things that was very hard for me is I would learn equations, okay, and the units, it was kind of hard to connect up the mathematics with the units. And the technical term for this, uh, which was addressed, and again, this may be a little more advanced by uh, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived that actually discovered what light was and everything was James Clerk Maxwell. And in about the mid-1800s, he realized that there were all these equations, but the units were garbled. And he wrote a very profound treatise, among many very profound treaties, uh, things that he wrote, about dimensional analysis. Now you would say to me, look, you can't, in a basic discussion of mathematics and geometry, you can't talk about dimensional analysis. My premise is, is that if you explain what it is, which is just basically connecting units and shapes, arithmetic and geometry, there's no better time to teach it because that is when you can get people to understand the connection between these manipulations you're making with your brain and how they relate to the physical world. But the, in fact, it isn't just some abstract thing. It's actually something that corresponds to something that's real and you can deal with it in terms of measurements. I don't think measurement is that complex a thing. I just think it gets separated and people don't teach it all together so it gets connected up. So what we now have is we've got arithmetic and we've got geometry. And when we combine arithmetic and geometry, we get units, entities, we get their shape in terms of lines and curves, their structure, etc. And at this point, we should interject the, under, the understanding of what measurement is, right there. Because the next branch of mathematics is really taking shapes and quantities and getting into measurements. And what I'm going to suggest to you that when we, do, when we deal with trigonometry, what we're basically doing is, and again, I don't, the, the tri stands for triangle. And what you can do if it's linear, if it's a line, is you can make anything that, that, whose, that its boundary is a line, okay, in terms of its dimensions, if it has 
more than just a line, you can make it into little triangles. In other words, I can take a triangle and make it into a square. I can take it. I can make it into anything I want to make it into. And the relationship of, and I'm just going to use two of them, let's say an equilateral triangle where the sides are equal and then we know the angles are all 60 degrees, or a right triangle, which is the one that's actually really used, we now have a relationship between the shape, okay, the angles, and again, without getting, this is the, the basis of most of trigonometry is the, from a man named Pythag Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem, which basically says if, you, if that length is C, that angle's 45 degrees, that angle's 45 degrees, and that angle's 90 degrees, that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we're using letters to denote these things, which is actually kind of an introduction into the next phase of mathematics. And I'm, hopefully you can sort of see how these feed into each other and so forth. So now what we can do is we can go from geometry and uh, structure, and if it's linear, it's triangles, and we now have a way to understand and process what we're actually doing to the physical world. We learn all these operations. I mean, you know, I remember learning what a sine is, what a cosine is, and tables that give you the mathematical thing. For me, at least, it was hard to understand, it was much harder to understand what I'm presenting here than it was to manipulate the numbers and create the equations. And what I think is, is that if you bring these things in earlier, you're going to actually be able to teach the operational part of it better because understanding promotes the ability to operate. If the other part of, tr of trig trigonometry is mostly triangles, okay? But the other thing that comes in here now is if we say they're curved things, there are certain relationships, there are certain relationships that are curved and circular. And part of, tri part of trigonometry and part of geometry is, is that you set up some coordinates to establish a position, and this enables you to do calculations that connect quantity, geometry, and position and shapes in the, in the real world. And in fact, this may go a little further that, than some of you would want to go, there basically then is you can set coordinates in terms of triangles, which are Cartesian coordinates, okay, which relate to straight lines and triangles, and then there are polar coordinates which actually describe what, where something is re relative to these lines, but you can look at this same point in terms of an angle, a distance, and a, and a circle. Now, not really going into that in any way, but this is all part of kind of understanding what you're really doing when you do mathematics, and goes all the way back to how the human brain is going to process the reality of the physical, physical mechanical world outside its body or inside its body. Now, you know, I've done something I don't like to do, and that is I've introduced a term here that I haven't really explained. But my whole purpose here is to say this stuff isn't complicated. I mentioned, I've mentioned Einstein, I've mentioned Maxwell. Another, another fella, and the, the, these people, because it wasn't all separated out now, and it's fascinating to go back to the Greeks and everything, almost all the mathematicians and scientists were philosophers. And you probably heard of Rene Descartes, and uh, his famous saying was, I think, therefore I am, which basically he was basically saying that the totality of any reality 
has to involve, for us, processing the external environment with understanding, which means there's the human brain. But to give you an idea how simple this can be, the way he came up with Cartesian coordinates is he was laying in his bed, and he looked up one morning, and there was a fly in the corner down at the end of the bed. And he watched the fly fly around, and it dawned on him that if he considered the lines that made the corner of the room, which is basically the intersection of three planes, the ceiling and two walls, he could specify exactly where the fly was at any point in time. And that basically is the crux of all of Newtonian physics and, and so forth. And I bring that up not to really get into all of that, but to show that these things that we present is very complicated. If you go back, even to the people that figured them out. They're very childlike and simple. And I take that sort of as, I don't know, a license or to try to validate my idea that we make this more complicated than we need to make it. And then we say, well, a child, we can't teach this to a child. Or I think we would be better off starting with what we could teach to a child and then adding the complications. Another one of my favorite stories is when Einstein was at Princeton, every afternoon he spent two or three hours talking to the faculty's children in the playroom. And finally the professors who he, you know, wouldn't teach advanced classes and stuff, asked the president, asked him why he did that. Not to tell him he couldn't do it, they were just curious. Obviously they treated Einstein with a lot of dignity and respect. So he called them in and he said, why? The, my faculty would like to know why you do that. And his answer, to me, is very profound. He said, that's where I learn the most. The point being that really understanding something means you can make it so simple and you can actually learn from the way a child processes it because it's very simple, it's very pure, it's not biased, it's not, it's like the and I, I don't know if it was Descartes, there's a phrase that kind of describes that as tabla and rasa. Okay, so now what we've done is we've de decided, we've defined what mathematics is, we've gone through arithmetic, geometry, and trigonometry, and we've kind of seen how they fit together. The next thing I'm going to go to is algebra. And what I'm going to suggest to you is, is that, you know, you remember you had, at least I don't, still this way, I, you know, I, I, would learn, I learned arithmetic, then I went, and I was just terrified of three things I was going to have to take in high school. Okay, what I was really terrified was uh, uh, poetry, music, and art, but, uh, you know, everybody's smart in some things. I, I actually like this, but... The normal trepidation is for geometry, trigonometry, and algebra. And they all kind of fit together. You learned arithmetic before you got there. But all algebra really is, is it allows you to use symbols. And what we do is we take, since there's only three ways that we can process this, okay, and I don't know, now with computers, they made, kids might be able to process images, but back in the old days when I went there, what we did is we took the simplest representation of words, which is letters. And all you really do for algebra, and once you explain this, is instead of taking full equations and getting all these complicated numbers, you just take an entity and you call it A. And then you take another entity and you call it, for example, B. Or maybe we call it X1, X2, which can be terrifying when you see these things with X1, X2. But all these are is they're a shorthand for, okay, things that when you look at them mathematically are very complicated. And you can stick them inside equations and stuff, and it enables you to do these very simple things 
without having to look at all the complexities of what's inside the entity. So, for example, you would have A equals B plus C. Or, this fits well here, when I talked about the uh, right triangle and the Pythagorean theorem, basically what we said was, instead of writing the numbers of the length and the, say, well, this is a straight line and everything, we just label this straight line A or C. This line is A or, or B, this line is A or B, and we say, that a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And that's really all algebra is. But some people are just terrified of this because they don't really understand that it's just a shorthand to do mathematics. And if you don't understand that, algebra can just turn into the craziest mess. And the uh, example I'm going to give you here would be, let's suppose, uh, I multiply a plus b times a plus b, and I would get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Well, I mean, you look at that and you go, what the heck is going on here? But if you really understand that what it is, is you're just doing a mathematical operation, multiplication, and there are a few rules you have to learn, but then all you do is you put letters in for the entities. It may not terrify you as much, but if you don't really understand that what algebra really is, is just the shorthand for doing mathematics, I, I, I would think you could get lost very easily, which is again my premise here, that that's what you should start out with. So. Now we've got all of this, and I've just got one more thing I need to put up, and I've kind of run out of space on my board here. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of tuck it in over here, which is good because it actually is, I think, one of the highest advances ever made in mathematics in terms of connecting the physical work, the, the uh, uh, neural, neural processing of the human brain to the physical world. And it's called calculus. And what calculus is basically is it puts all of this together. And that's kind of why it's taught last. I mean, you know, you can get into advanced calculus and all. But in terms of basic mathematics, calculus is the thing that takes all of this and puts it together. And, and how does it do that? And I may not like it being squinched up here. Maybe you need to focus in on it a little bit in the recording. But it's really not that complicated. What it is, basically, is calculus as all mathematics does, looks at change. But what it does is it looks at a change where things go from being little pieces to big pieces. So they go basically from, and let's use something that I haven't introduced, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about, but let's use infinity. And we're going to say that infinity is the biggest thing there can be. And the sign for infinity is like an 8 laying down on its side. So the smallest thing, if you understand division, would be 1 over infinity. So little pieces add up and move towards infinity. And if you take infinity and break it down into little pieces, okay, so now I can look at anything geometrically and I can put all of this together and I can look at composition, change, etc. And if I go this way from little to big, that's called integration. 
taking little things and putting them together to make big things. And it, let's see, I, I can, I'll write that here. Integration. And if I take a big thing and make it smaller, that's called differentiation. And again, uh, our friend Isaac Newton invented calculus. And it's a completely separate talk that I'd like to present to you at some point. Because what he did was he looked at gravity. And he came up with two things. He, he came up with what are called sometimes the laws of motion, which is what happens when things bump into you, into each other. And then he created this thing called the gravitational field to kind of explain how they interact with each other. But in order to do that, he had to develop a thing that passed through something that he couldn't measure. And what you can't measure What you can't measure is something that's so small you don't have a unit or you don't have anything that will perceive it. Okay? So on, 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 if I'm going and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, it goes from 1 over infinity and then it goes to something that's so small I, I can't measure it. And that basically is zero or you could represent it as a question mark. You can't really know what it is. But if I take enough of these and make some assumptions, which is what calculus does, and provide equations, I can know where that's going to be if I differentiate it. And then if I go on the other side, I can actually do a calculation that tells me if I add enough of these up, I'll know what I'll end up with, and that's called integration. And that's basically what calculus is. It enables you to make things bigger by adding little things together. That's called integration. And to make things smaller mathematically by taking big things and breaking them up into little pieces. And the thing that he really developed with this was this idea that there are certain things that we can't really know and understand because they're either too big or they're too small, but we can deal with them mathematically through this magical thing he created called calculus. And it's really not that hard because it's just, you know, some equations, but very few people, I think, would expect will explain to you exactly what you're doing when you do calculus. So then you can look at changes and you can actually take things and look at a change that's getting bigger from something that's smaller or something that's getting smaller from something that's bigger and you can express it mathematically which again gives us comfort in terms of our human brain. Ah, but what about this thing here? this zero, that we have to sort of fudge it mathematically to know what it is. Now we're back here to category three in terms of existence. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that uh, what people of faith deal with this as, and this is, you'll hear Stephen Hawking talking about God and so forth, is they ascribe it to faith and God I mean, the Greeks described it to gods with a small g, and other people in terms of their soul and everything ascribe it to faith or God with a big G. And what the scientist calls it, and I'm going to go back to my red marker now just so that this will match, is a singularity. And where you hear about a singularity is like uh, with the black hole or, or, or with the, the Big Bang. And it started out as a singularity. What that means is it started out with something that we really don't 
We can't measure, we can't understand it, we don't know what it is. So, in a, in a way, the question between science and faith has to do with understanding what a singularity is. And in my mind, if you look at it this way, there's really no conflict here. The more we can make it smaller, the more scientific we, we are, and the smaller we make the singularity. But if you understand where it comes from and how Newton derived this, I, it's very hard to think, since he fudged it, and parenthetically, just the way he fudged the gravitational field until Einstein straightened that out, since he fudged it, I don't think he had any idea that he could actually eliminate it. And I think a lot of the controversy between faith and science comes back to not understanding how this works between the human brain and physical reality and then our limitations which will lead us into a spirituality. And what I would suggest is, is that uh, this is a, a simple way to educate and teach mathematics that will provide better understanding and enable us to operate, apply results, uh, have, be have better performance. Uh, in, in terms of mathematics, and the most dangerous thing in education is either a curriculum or a teacher. And this is, <laughs> this could be controversial. A curriculum or a teacher that doesn't take into account, if it's a curriculum, or a teacher who doesn't know what he doesn't know. My idea here is, is that because in part it's hard to simplify this, a lot of our education is more complicated than it needs to be, and that if we would look at it in this context, which I think can be presented fairly simply, with understanding put in early on, as early as possible, and combined with operations and applications, we'll end up with advancement in terms of uh, humankind's state and condition. And what I've tried to do is I've tried to take one branch that's taught, mathematics, give it a broader definition that's based on understanding and then go through and show how each, what each part of it really is in this broader context with the idea being that if as soon as possible we taught it that way, we would end up with advancement in terms of humankind's prog progress because there would be increased understanding and in terms of education, I think, as far as understanding is concerned, the sooner the better, the sooner the better. That's the talk.